Hello, my name is Charles. I'm a solution architect, and today I'll be presenting a session on the no-code method to build automated Amazon forecast operations pipelines. Here's a quick peek at the agenda in our time together. First, I'll give an overview of the Amazon forecast service. Then I'll show how to build an automated ML operations pipeline. And then finally, I'll lead you through a demonstration to actually show that operations pipeline in action. This slide is meant to show the Amazon forecast service at the macro level view. And as the slide says, Amazon forecast is a fully managed service, which means customers don't have to worry about provisioning, patching, and securing enough compute capacity to train a machine learning model. Instead, a simple ABI call is all that's needed, and they can benefit from the R&D that comes to deliver st several state-of-the-art time series models. We're continuing to invest in new capabilities too. We've already delivered new features this year, such as model drift detection, feature explainability, and what if scenario modeling. But this all starts as shown in the diagram on the left, where customers import their historical data into Amazon Forecast. And in the center with the data imported, the service then sets up a data pipeline that helps to train time series models based on your unique data and providing accuracy metrics, and of course, generating future dated forecasts. Let's take a quick peek at how data is prepared for Amazon Forecast. The key point I wanna make here on this and the next couple slides ahead is that Amazon Forecast is very flexible. It lets you design the data layout according to your own needs. And flexibility is key in supporting a diverse set of customer needs, regardless of the data scale, the industry, or the use case. So first, let's talk about target time series. This is a mandatory data set that contains your historical demand. So for example, it's the item you're trying to forecast and also the demand values in the past. This is, this is what the system can learn from in a, in a univariate model. Next is related time series. Related time series are the data that should have some correlation with the target value. They should have some statistical strength and it should improve the overall accuracy of a model. Common examples of this include price or promotions or third-party data sets, such as hyper-local events. And many customers ask us, well, what data should we bring? And our advice is to first identify the data that you think matters to your use case. And you might already know what drives your, 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 your sales or your incidents in the, in the past higher or lower. And as a business, what kind of motions do you take or what kind of actions or activities help you drive up your target value? And likewise, what kind of things do you know that actually may help drive down the target value? These are some of the ideas of, about the information that you would bring to your related time series. And then finally, the last type of data that I want to highlight here, it's called item metadata. And this is also an, an, an optional data set, and it's categorical var variables that are static. Uh, unlike the related time series, the related time series, the data moved in time, and here these do not change over time. So common, common examples of this would include, you know, a retailer might provide things like their departments or categories or brand and things of that nature. This information is used and it's picked up by the deep learning algorithms to learn similarities between products, which can be useful, especially if new products are introduced into the market. So the purpose of this slide is just to kind of reinforce what I've just talked about with target time series and related time series, and to show how these two things can interact. So we have, for example, a historical demand data, and you can see that there's ebbs and tides in the target, in the, in the target time series. Also, there's a related time series here. So imagine there's a promotion that's, that's happening. So in the periods of time when the promotion is active, you would set the promotion value to one or true. And then in the time periods where the promotion is turned off, you set that value to a zero. And as you can see here, visually, there's a relationship. Uh, when the promotion is, is actually true, this actually tends to stimulate the demand. And then when the promotion is false, it tends to cause the demand to drop down. And so this is, this is just to show you an example of how you might visualize those interactions of these. Um, one thing to know as well, you bring all your data from your history all the way up to the current period. And Amazon Forecast will take care to split the data 
into a train set and a test set. And, and ultimately what happens here is the data model is built in, against the training set of data. And then that data model is, is actually executed or inference or predictions are made against a, a, your, your test set of data. And this is nice because the, the, the ground truth is already known. And that, that is a way that Amazon Forecast is able to uh, benchmark and demonstrate accuracy metrics ag against uh, known data sets. So on this slide, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper just into uh, building a machine learning model. This is meant to illustrate how Amazon Forecast does do that training. And we call this ensembling with our auto predictor. Amazon Forecast supports several underlying statistical models and also a few deep neural network models. But customers simply put in a request, it's an API call called Create Auto Predictor, and that runs on all the underlying base models and then performs an ensembling routine at every single time series in the set. So that means that every single time series can receive um, a unique or a bespoke recipe, which is going to be a blend of predictions from one or more of those underlying base models. Using ensembles models, we can call that as the wisdom of the crowd. This actually helps increase performance by as much as 40% compared to any one single model alone. In short, what that means is that each time series has a perfected model to match its signature with a goal of improving accuracy at every single time series. Once the model is built, the other thing that Amazon Forecast will do, it will provide you feedback that looks like this, that, let, that helps you to determine if the values you've provided in your related time series and item metadata were helpful in building a better model. And so on things that here in the top that are in the blue, these things have a positive correlation. As those values increase, so does your, your, your thing that you're predicting. So for example, in this case, it's demand or sales. So uh, also in the, in the bottom part, these are negative correlations. And so when, when these values change, that actually helps to produce a, a lower recommended model, a lower, a lower prediction. And between these two, they're both important. While they, they both help to over and under correct so that you have the best model uh, possible for the time series. Here with inventory management, there's very important costs related with over and under forecasting. Generally, over forecasting can lead to high inventory carrying costs and waste, uh, whereas under forecasting can lead to stockouts, unmet demand, and missed revenue opportunities. Amazon Forecast helps you optimize these costs for your business objective. And so what we're showing here are quantiles. And the way to interpret this would be that um, if you select a P50, then that means that the value shown here, 300, there's a 50% chance that the true number is going to be 50, per, is going to be at or below the 300 mark. That also means that there's a 50% chance that the number will be above the 50% mark. On the other hand, here's an example of a P75, and the way you would interpret this is the, uh, there's a 75% chance that the true number will be at 600 or less. And that also means that there's a 25% there's a chance that the number will be greater than 600. So these are, these are examples of how Amazon Forecast can be used to pick the right supply point for every single item in the time series. Most businesses don't work at P50 because they enjoy a greater profit by having product available um, than having uh, the product not there. So that's just an example of how the service will provide um, inference and give you a wide uh, flexibility here to, to run business and make business choices. We've got a couple more slides here uh, to, to highlight some of the key capabilities of the service. One of the things we get asked a lot about is these what-if scenarios. So customers want to know in the future, if I change how I'm doing things, like if I change my price of something or if I change promotions, how does that impact my future? So this is an example of a couple scenarios that Amazon Forecast can be used uh, to help uh, make business, business um, a planning events. So for example, here on uh, scenario one, we can call that the baseline where there's, there's a set of promotions in the future where you know that during this period, the promotion will be active and then the promotion will be turned off. And the forecast might look like this. So for example, you can also create a secondary scenario where you decide, I wanna keep that promotion on and then you can see that the outcome looks a little bit different in the future as well. 
So as a business, what you might do is measure the cost of the promotion or cost of the discount that will be provided. And you can also measure the number of units of change in your future uh, multiplied by your profit, for example. And then you can kind of get some empirical data here to understand if you do want to make this change in the future planning or not. And then the final thing I'll highlight here with regard to the, the background of the service is when Amazon Forecast executes your predictions for the future, it gives you rich data that's in CSV format, that, and that means it's very open. It means that you can act on it using a, any number of BI tools that you use, or you can also turn this into event handling. That way you can orchestrate and deliver the data to the one or more places in your organization that need to consume that data, such as ERP or planning systems and so forth. All right, so that concludes the first part of the agenda, which is just to highlight some of the key features of Amazon Forecast Service. In this part, I'm going to highlight some uh, items that are used to build an automated ML operations or ML ops pipeline to make that, what we've just talked about, more automatic. This starts with, with AWS CloudFormation. Deploying Automated Amazon Forecast workflows starts by using a service called AWS CloudFormation. CloudFormation is a way to provision and deprovision cloud infrastructure as code. So instead of clicking through an AWS console or writing code to create and manage new Amazon Forecast workflows, you're able to stand up the core Amazon Forecast workflows without writing code. And when CloudFormation runs, it's able to ask you some questions. We call these parameters in the moment, which allows the solution to be highly variable and adapt to your specific need. All the AWS resources created while executing these CloudFormation templates are all bundled together in something called a stack. And that stack is deployed together, it can be upgraded, and it can also be uh, deleted together. And that helps your, keep your AWS account tidy. And notice there's two kinds of stacks here uh, provided as part of our solution. We start with the permission dependency stack here on the left, which is executed only one time per AWS account. And this contains some specific AWS permissions that allows you to build a workflow, and it gives you access to do other things, such as to use S3 and to run Amazon Forecast APIs, among others. The permission dependency stack will also create a new S3 bucket for you to hold all your data, or you can also leverage a pre-existing bucket if you have one. And then on the right are what we call solution guidance stacks. And so you can have one of these for each workload that you want to manage. You might actually have several concurrent workloads. But the point here is that these are all decoupled, uh, allowing new ones to be created or old ones to be deprecated without causing issue or tight, tight dependencies between these. So each time your business wants to forecast a new business topic, you just simply stand up a new CloudFormation stack. This slide is meant to show you how, when launching those, those CloudFormation stacks, the answers that you're providing to the parameters here on the left are actually stored in another AWS service called Parameter Store here on the right. So uh, th what that allows you to do is later on, you might want to change some of the values in the parameter store to create new outcomes. For example, this allows you to run experiments. Experiment one might be to create a predictor when you backfill data in your time series with zero values. Uh, and then another example is you may want to have another uh, a secondary experiment where you, want, you might want to do a backfill with, with some, a different strategy, like a mean value. And that may provide different outcomes. You can also do things here like change your forecast horizon. So maybe you're forecasting for eight weeks and want to make it be a 12-week forecast. So all you do is come to the parameter store and make that change. So I just talked about cloud formation and how that creates AWS infrastructure. So in addition to saving all the parameters that you provided in the parameter store, the cloud formation template also creates several step functions. So AWS Step Functions, they're a serverless mechanism that helps orchestrate process workflows. The Step Function can do things like make things happen serially. For example, you might want to run Step 1 and wait for that to complete before moving forward to Step 2. And you can also use Step Functions to run things in parallel. And I'll show you that on, um, on our demo as we're working ahead. 
But for this purpose, these stop functions, they're, they're very uh, useful in performing very specific Amazon forecast processes in a specific way. Um, that way, instead of having to create all of these workflows from zero, the stop functions already provide you a head start. You might choose to use them exactly as they're delivered, or you might want to bend them a little bit to meet your unique needs. And this is an example of a typical sequence of events that might occur at a prediction cycle. Uh, and they're all essentially the same, uh, no matter if that cycle is daily or weekly or monthly or otherwise. So in this case, uh, one, of the, one of the things you would do as a customer is go in and harvest your historical data from where that lives at rest. That's called the extract of the latest data. The, the next macro level thing that we would do is to import that into Amazon Forecast. And then sometimes we'll create a predictor. Uh, sometimes predictors or these models are very stable for days or weeks or sometimes months. Uh, but the, the new model would be created as needed. And then the forecast of data points would be generated. Uh, and then finally, uh, the, the thing that you would do as a customer is you would take the CSV data that comes out of Amazon Forecast and then integrate those into the one or more uh, uh, enterprise systems that you have, including ERP systems and including your BI platforms and so forth. So with that, um, now that we kind of have a little bit of background of the uh, cloud formations and step functions, I'm going to switch over now to the console and show you this in action. All right, so I'm going to start the demo by going to GitHub. Uh, I actually have an AWS samples GitHub repository for Amazon forecast samples. And in that, there's a folder called MLOps. So this, this will actually lead you on your own time. You can go through um, and you know, follow the directions, and it will lead you through the end to end of building a, an automated forecast. But for today, what I'm going to do is, is highlight something specific. So I'm going to go to this food demand file. And essentially, one of the things you need to do as a customer, you know, we talked about on the prior uh, slides about the importance of a target time series and a related time series. So one of the things you'll need to do is to plan the data that you want to forecast. And so this is just a, an example using a synthetic data set. But one of the things that you'll do ahead of time is to think about well, what that looks like. So for example, your item metadata, if you choose to do that, we'll have the item ID. This is a mandatory field. And then a couple other variables if you want them, these categorical variables. Uh, if you choose to have a related time series, you'll also need to provide that as well. And, and so you'll, you'll end up making a SQL query or you'll make a CSV file that, that it actually is the same shape uh, and the same physical order that you would uh, you know, make here. So this is the actual, this JSON body here is what Amazon Forecast understands. And that's how it knows uh, which features in your data uh, belong to uh, which function. And so, for example, this would be a CSV file or a query that has location ID and item ID and then so forth. And then, of course, the target time series contains things like the, the, the location you're forecasting for, the item, and then the, uh, the historical value and then timestamp. So uh, I'm going to actually not walk through all of this. You can, you can definitely look at this at, at, um, offline. And then uh, also, if you're interested, let your, let your account team or your solution architect know. Uh, we can help you uh, through um, a workshop as well. But to get started, here at the top of this page, there's a YAML file. Uh, I'm going to hover over this, and my browser let, lets me copy this into Clipboard. And what this is going to is essentially all of that inf all the information for, that CloudFormation will use to spin up some infrastructure. So with that in my clipboard, I'm going to move over here to the AWS console. And the first service I'm going to go to is CloudFormation. What I'd, I'd like to let you know, there's already a, a couple of stacks ahead of time. So uh, just in the interest of time, I've went ahead and built a forecast. So we've got the finished product here. It's called Stack 2. But in the moment here, we're going to get started with building a new stack. Uh, called stack one, just so you can understand the mechanical or see the mechanical uh, steps to go through. I'm going to click on this create stack button and then specify with new resources. And then scrolling down that YAML file that was in the clipboard out of, off of GitHub, that's just going to be pasted here and then click next. And this is going to be called stack one. 
you might choose your organization may have standards on how you name things, naming conventions, or you might choose to name it something that's uh, uh, unique and describes the kind of workload that you're forecasting. Just for simplicity, say I'm calling this stack one. And uh, also, you, if you recall in the slide deck, we talked about different parameters. So you can actually override these in the moment. So this is the data frequency for your related time series. So if your data happens to be at yearly or monthly or other grains, you can specify that here. Uh, but for the demo today, this is going to be set for a weekly time series. And then the data set group, I'll also call this stack one. Most of these values are ready to go. And this is already configured for that food demo data set. The one thing that you do have to provide is you've got to provide an S3 bucket. So this can be an, uh, this, this would be, uh, need to be an S3 bucket that you've already created. The other thing that you'll do is provide um, an email address that you want to receive a notification at. And that way, when you, um, you know, are running the process, it will send you an email when it's done. That way you know to come and pick up your forecast. So after setting that, I'm going to click on the next button here. Next button one more time, and then go to the bottom of this third page and acknowledge that the cloud formation is going to create some IAM uh, resources and stand up new infrastructure. Next, I'm going to click on Create Stack. And this will take about a minute or so to provision. Meanwhile, if you click on the, uh, the Resources tab here, this will start to give us a list of all of the things that are being created. This is all the infrastructure being created as part of that stack being stood up. So we're creating some step, uh, step functions. Uh, we're also creating some parameters to hold our responses and, uh, some, and, and so forth. So again, let's take about a minute to create. The other thing is I'm going to move over here while that's working, and this is uh, looking at the S3 service. So this is an, a bucket that was created uh, here called Forecast MLOps Tech Talk 2, and we can see that there's a single folder called Stack 2. Again, that's that single stack that I had already created ahead of time, um, and you can see that there is not something here called Stack 1. Uh, also, just to peek into this, what exists under these, these folders or under these stacks are going to be your input data. So that's going to be a folder for your item metadata, a folder for your related time series and target time series, respectively. Uh, also, once you produce a data model, the system will provide you with some backtest export data. It'll provide you accuracy metrics at a single time series, as well as forecasted values also during that backtest window. And then once you've created future data forecasts, those also land. And they're, they're, they look like this. They're just going to be CSV files, but they're going to be housed inside of the forecast folder. But I just wanted to set you up to, uh, here to understand what the, what the folder structure looks like in, on S3. I'm going to hop back over here to CloudFormation now and just do a refresh. And we can see that Stack 1 is indeed completed. And uh, also, all of our, uh, our events are completed. So next thing that, that I like to do, and this is kind of be a one-off for the demo today, but Amazon Forecast and this whole end-to-end uh, -end infrastructure has the ability to go get data from, uh, it can be a various database. So I'm going to highlight that example today where we're going to use the Athena service to go out and get historical data and then land that data in S3 that then Amazon Forecast can ingest. I've already typed in some queries ahead of time, but for example, this is just an example of what the, the history data might look like. So I'm doing select star from food demo uh, and the food uh, demand history table. I'm going to go ahead and execute that. And uh, what we can see here, that, that there are values for the location, for the item, the time in the, in the past. This is the, the target value or the true demand for that period. And then these all these uh, other variables as well, such as the price, the promotion, Booleans, uh, yes or no, there was an email promotion, yes or no, there was a, an, uh, a homepage promotion, and then those categorical values. So the overall category, beverages, and then a subcategory. So these are going to be the categorical values that move over to uh, the item metadata. So while this is one flat file, this is uh, it needs to be shaped a little bit more specifically for Amazon Forecast to ingest. 
So this is an example of how we can go out and cut away fields and prepare them uh, for Amazon forecast ingestion. So here, uh, I'm querying that same table, but now there's a select distinct. Uh, we're pulling out a couple fields. So just to show you an example, and you might want to do this for all of your data if you're getting your data from a database or a data lake. You would test out your queries to make sure they're right, and then that looks like what you want. You can also add you know, where clauses to kind of govern what kind of data you want to bring as well. But that's just to kind of show you, and we can do the same here for, for related and, and target. But I think in the interest of time, let's go over to um, our next service that we talked about in the slide presentation, which is step functions. All right, so for, for stack one, we have several step functions that were created as part of that cloud formation deployment. And these include the things such as create data set group. So this is gonna be the thing that you do one time and one time only. Um, and then the other things that you'll do on a recurring basis, such as import new data, such as from time to time, build a new predictor, and also uh, each cycle you will produce a future forecast. And those are all held within the other stuff functions like create forecast and create predictor and then import data set. So the idea here is that you have all of these step functions. They're all standalone. They do something very specific. And then you can orchestrate these in a way that makes sense for you and your business. And in fact, the, the specific use case that you're, that, that you're working on. So I'm going to click on one of these here, the create data set group, just to show you what this looks like inside. You don't need to do this, but I am going to go through and edit this in Workflow Studio just to kind of show you that the thoughtfulness of, of having to um, execute code and then keep track of it. Uh, you don't have to start from zero. We've, we've already built a solution for this that helps make this automatic. I'm going to go ahead at this point and I'm going to click on start execution to launch that step function. And then we can see some visual here inside the state machine. We can see that it's actually in progress. And this will just take about a minute uh, to complete. And it's done that. We can see that it's green now, meaning it's all completed. So one of the things that I can do over now is to let's let's actually open up another tab and go over to Amazon Forecast. And if I click on data set groups, you can see that just now stack one uh, was created. The next thing that we'll do is we're going to go get data from, from a data lake and place that into S3. We can see still here for the S3, there is no stack one, but we're about to set it up to, to, to go get that now. If you recall in that slide presentation in the prior section, we talked about uh, systems manager and parameter store. So what I'm going to do now is to take the queries that we've built, these Athena queries, and we're going to place them in the parameter store. And there are about 20 parameters for every stack that you have. Uh, for example, here, if we just look at the stack ones and for the things that are related to the data set group, there are many different parameters here. Um, so, for example, if you're including or not including related time series, what the frequency of your data is, uh, what your S3 bucket name is, um, the layout of your data, and so forth. All these are, are parameters that you, you can change um, if need be. The first thing that, that we'll do is we're going to set the values for, for our queries. So there are three queries that we'll need to define, uh, the target time series, the related time series, and the item metadata. So on another screen, I'm going to go get for the target time series. I'm going to go get the query and click Edit here, and then place that SQL statement, the one that you've tested and vetted and, and certified that, yes, this is the, the data that you're prepared to forecast. Save changes. And then we'll do the same thing for the related time series. We're going to change it from a kind of a, a, a starter here to something that's meaningful. You can see that we're providing the, uh, you know, the item, the location, and all these um, multivariate values, the things that help improve the forecast. And then finally, for the item metadata, we're going to provide 
something that helps describe our items categorically with our select distinct clause. All right, so that's all there is there that we need to do. And I'm going to move back over to the step functions window. All right, as I mentioned, uh, there are, are several different step functions here. You can run them individually. And as, actually, as you're getting started, what you should do is to run the create data set group like we've just did, uh, completed. But then you would also need to manually run your import data set and then manually run your create predictor. And then ultimately here, what you'll do is to look at the outcomes of that predictor at the time series, and you'll look at statistics to understand uh, the performance of the model. And you'll also look at the back test data to look, uh, make sure that the model is performing to your standards. Once you're satisfied with that, and only after you're satisfied with that, should you move forward to building a forecast, your future horizon. Um, because frankly, in, until your data model is correct, and your back test windows are good, that's going to be your canary. And, and if that is performing well, then, then all of the things being the same, your future forecast should, should perform well additionally. But for today's purposes, instead of running the, all of those individually, uh, what I'll we'll show you is there's a stack workflow that would be created. And it looks like this. So what this will do is to go out and run the Athena connector, and it will go run all of those individual queries to go get the data from the database where it lives at rest, and then bring them to S3. The next thing it would do after that's completed is to import the data into Amazon Forecast. And then once that's completed, and that may take 10 or 15 minutes, depending on the size of your data, because we have to provision and deprovision de clusters. Uh, but once that is completed, then the step function will thoughtfully automatically launch the create predictor. And this create predictor is compute intense. Again, this could take 45 minutes or maybe an hour or more. But when it does complete, uh, the next thing that will happen is it will get set up and automatically uh, choose the best predictor. And, and in, in the beginning, there's only one. Um, but, but over a period of time, you may have different predictors and they have different performance characteristics. And then finally, uh, the forecast will be, be generated. So for today's purpose, I'm just going to kick this off. I didn't make any changes. But I did want you to look under the hood to see uh, the, the way that the workflow has been engineered. Again, this is as delivered, but you can change this to meet your, your individual needs. So clicking Start ex Execution, you can see it's off and running. It's, it's going through the Athena connector phase right now. So it's actually going out to, to Amazon Athena, running the different queries, running them in parallel. Now, while that's happening, what that means is, is it's depositing those, those files here on S3. So if I come back over here to S3 and I do a refresh, we see that now there's a new folder created called Stack1. I'm going to open that folder, and we also see that that process, that is Amazon Athena, it deposited the results of those SQL queries right here onto S3 for you. And that means you don't have to go and, and offline, you know, build the data and then deposit them here. It just makes it a little bit more friction-free. So this is a CSV file. This is the item metadata CSV file, and it contains those categorical values from that select distinct query that we looked at earlier. Um, and then the next thing, if we go back over to the step function, we see that the Athena connector is completed. And at this point, it's doing um, a, an import data set. And as I mentioned, this part will, you know, can take 10 minutes or so to run. Uh, but, but during our time together today, we're going to use a little bit of um, you know, time compression. And instead of letting you uh, watch all of this execute, which may take about an hour and a half, we'll go ahead and I'm going to move up to stack two. And we can look at a prior workflow that was run for stack two. And just to show you what this would look like if we had you know, about an hour here, uh, it would actually go through, create the predictor and, and so forth. And you can also see the elapsed time as well. So you can see it took about an hour and a half to go through all the process of, of training a model and then building an inference. And ultimately here in stack two, uh, this is what produced these back test data. And it's also what produced the forecasted data points. <clears throat> So um, that's what I wanted to show just in terms of how easy it is to orchestrate it. But I would like to call out uh, just as, as an option, if you don't want to run the Athena connector, another thing that you can do is to go out and, and write your own queries or somehow uh, through Excel spreadsheets or otherwise, uh, whatever is convenient for you as an organization, you would actually build the CSV files 
and then deposit them onto Amazon S3. So that is also a viable path forward. If you don't want to use the Athena connector, you, you can just make your CSVs and then deposit them here. You'll just put them inside of the uh, item related and target time series is appropriate. All right, I'm going to take a, a quick pause here. And just the final thing I want to show you is maybe how do you visualize some of this data? And that will wrap up our, our demo. Okay, as I mentioned, during the, during the back test windows, um, Amazon Forecast will produce uh, accuracy metrics at every time series in the set. So this is a tabular way to look at the data. Underneath this visual tool, this is Amazon QuickSight, our, our BI tool. Underneath this BI tool is the actual data produced from Amazon Forecast. It's just in plain CSV files on S3, and this is just a view on top of that. But you can see for every item, uh, and every location combination, there's different levels of accuracy metrics, such as the mean average percent error, root mean squared error, and others. And of course, every time series will have its own unique spread of performance. So one thing you might do, uh, and by the way, every data set in the world typically has some outlier or two. So one thing you might want to do is to kind of look at the data like this, and maybe a scatter plot or otherwise, and then you're able to look at, you know, most of the time series are performing well. They have they have low error rates, but there are some that are maybe have an anomaly here where uh, this item number 2826 uh, for location 177, you know, it has something interesting. So uh, as an analyst, you might want to look at this and uh, understand you know, what's happening under the scene. So that's one way that you can look, uh, use, use our accuracy metrics to kind of dive a little bit deeper uh, and look at your data on a, on a time series basis. And this is another view that is produced by the back test uh, data as well. Uh, and what this shows, and this is during the test period of data, so for every period and for every item and location, we know the true historical target value. This is the true demand value in the past. And then for this use case, it's been set up to generate quantiles at the P50 and the P60 and P70 level. Um, many businesses don't work at the P50, again, because there's an asymmetry. There's more reward for businesses to have supply uh, and a little bit of overstock than to underserve the customer. And so uh, what you can see here, just in, as an eyeball, the true value was 1,000. At the P70, the, the predicted value was 985. So, so pretty good. Uh, this just underserves by 10. You can always choose higher P values if you want to guarantee higher customer service rates uh, for, for given time series. Um, and, and then here's another example of one that the true value is 1202. And this was just a little bit of an overshot of 1215. You know, and we could cursor through these and they all kind of tell their same story. But what, what I would highlight is that the order of magnitude on these tends to be um, in agreement. So that's just one way to kind of visualize it. And um, I hope this has been helpful. I, just to summarize what we've done in the demo, we've, we've stood up infrastructure through CloudFormation. Uh, we've used the step functions that, that, that were created by CloudFormation to actually orchestrate the series of steps of importing data into Amazon Forecast to building a model and then producing inference against that predictor model. And then finally, what we've done here is just kind of visualize some different ways to look at it. I hope, hope very much that this has been helpful for you and maybe inspires you to think about how you can cause change in your organization. Uh, we would definitely like feedback here if there's anything um, we can provide from your account team or the specialist solution architects, we're here to help. What we'll do here is to uh, cut away from the demo. I want to go back to slides and we'll, we'll round out a, a recap of what we've just covered. Okay, just to highlight what we've done in the demo, uh, using AWS CloudFormation, we stood up a new solution guidance stack called Stack One, and that actually provisioned several step functions for us. We executed first the data set group. We did that as a one-time event. And then uh, using the workflow step function, the workflow was actually responsible for going in and, and getting our history, importing that data, creating the predictor, and then generating the forecast. And then finally, we rounded it out with uh, the ability to kind of look at the data. So again, just to remind you, this is kind of the cycle of forecasting workflows that are, that are created uh, from everything from getting the data from where it lives at rest, the historical truth, and then on the far right to producing uh, future data data you know, looking at it, um, using it in a BI way, or maybe integrating that back with your ERP system or systems. So hopefully this has been very helpful for you. Uh, thank you very much for your attention today. And if you have any questions, please let uh, your account team or your account essay know, and we're happy to help. Thank you so much.